Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another lockdown lecture. Uh, this one by Steve Previk, who needs very little introduction, but it's the second in, in a series of talks that, about uh, geochemical variation in, in igneous rocks that he's able to give. Um, as I said, Steve needs very little introduction. He obtained his uh, first, his BSc honors degrees in his uh, from McMaster University and uh, University of, uh, followed up with University of Alberta in Edmonton with a PhD specializing in the acquisition and application of radiogenic isotope data along with geochemistry and petrology to the study of the origins and evolution of various Proterozoic mafic intrusions. Now he's, he's been around the block with the isotope geochemistry guys. He set up and maintained uh, isotope labs in Ottawa, Montreal, and Sudbury while completing his PhD. He then moved to Vitz University where he spent six years in the isotope facility at what was the Bernard Price Institute of Geophysical Research, BPI Geophysics. He has been a member of the academic staff in geology at Rhodes University since 2004 where he teaches and conducts research in high temperature magmatic processes mainly to do with layered mafic in intrusions and uh, impact melts. So Steve, with that, um, take it away and uh, looking forward to an interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Carry on. Thank you very much, Craig. Good to be back online here. So this talk, um, or the title of the talk, has been reduced to just talking about the effects of contamination in this lecture. Uh, I won't be talking about differentiation or subsolid processes today. I decided I had enough to say. So we will just get on with it here. So what distinguishes crustal contamination as a process is that we are combining or mixing two compositionally distinct components together. Um, many of the, I mean, at least one of the geochemical com components must be different for it to matter, um, or the temperature, arguably. Um, so the, what distinguishes crustal contamination from processes such as magma mixing or mingling, the kinds of things I talked about in my July version of this, is that in crustal contamination, um, the two components are at different temperatures. So we must um, use up energy to consume the contaminant by the host material. So typically a basaltic sort of magma consuming some sort of crustal rock, which is several hundred degrees or even thousands of degrees or a thousand degrees cooler. So the implication of this is that the fact that there are energy budget restrictions means there are limits to the, the amount of material we can assimilate. So there are mass balance restrictions on the effect crustal contamination can bring to a magma. And typically, we normally see numbers anywhere from a few percent up to, um, in extreme cases, say 30 or 40 percent, as some people have proposed for parts of the bushveld, for example. Um, just for the record, the maximum amount of crustal material that is possible to be assimilated into a basaltic magma is on the order of 50 to 60 percent, which is a huge amount. There was a study by Reiners et al. in geology in 1995, where they, I think they showed that the maximum was about 50 percent, but you could get and squeeze another 10 percent um, if you had a lot of olivine crystallizing from the magma then the latent heat of crystallization from the olivine would provide extra heat energy. But essentially, by the end of that process, you don't no longer have a basaltic rock, and it is presumably completely solidified as all of the energy in the magma has been consumed in order to facilitate this assimilation. So that's our maximum upper limit. So where do we expect to see contamination? We'll just work our way from the bottom to the top. So as a mantle process, normally we're talking about magma mixing, but 
we could envision contamination of a melt in the mantle um, in the form of residual crystals from the source area being carried along upwards with the magma as it ascends. So essentially the magma is the melt is being contaminated by its source. So presumably we are restricted to fine grains which can be transported without settling or sinking. We have relatively low viscosity magmas um, and we have relatively dense crystals. So that combination is not conducive to collecting, at least not from the mantle all the way up. It is likely that if we're talking about granitic melts, then this process probably is very important, where we do believe that transport of the, the residues from partial melting, the rest site, um, can be carried along in the melt as it ascends, because the melt is much more viscous, the temperatures are lower, so the contrasts are much smaller in the physical properties. Um, it's likely that contamination would take place in um, physical locations where the ascending magma is stalled for um, hydrodynamic reasons, such as at the base of the crust or perhaps at the base of the lithosphere. So any place that sits for a long time and has a chance to heat up its surroundings and potentially interact with them. And we usually describe these kinds of environments as so-called staging chambers. So um, sort of magma chambers or virtual intrusions where it's not yet crystallizing very fast, um, but we invoke this location as a place to undertake certain types of contamination that are inconvenient for us to have in the upper crust. So as the magma then ascends up to the crust, it passes through the lower crust first. And in general, we would assume that it's difficult to assimilate lower crustal rocks. So even though they are much hotter than upper crustal rocks, so less energy is required to heat them up to melting temperatures, they typically are not easy rocks to melt. If it's mafic lower crust, it has a high melting temperature. If it's granulite facies lower crust, the presumption is that the easy to partially melt materials, volatile rich stuff, the eutectic granite type fraction of that rock may have already been extracted. And so what's left is a refractory or difficult to melt residual material. Um, so depending on the heat of the magma and how fast it's moving through this material though, um, it's possible that some lower crustal material may get assimilated. And I'll show you a couple of examples shortly based on different types of evidence so from the Bushveld complex, um, based on trace element geochemistry and some neodymium isotope data from the Kemi intrusion and then a little Grenvillian crustal study looking at granitoids. So the implication from indirect evidence or by yeah, inference is that middle or lower crustal material seems to show itself. So it's not impossible for it to happen. And then Bruce Marsh, perhaps controversially, has proposed that um, magmas are people in his version, they're deriving all of their phenocrysts to produce layered rocks in layered intrusions by collecting those phenocrysts in the plumbing system in the crust. So as the magma has ascended through the crust, it cools against its walls and starts crystallizing and subsequent streams of magma, so either later versions of the same pulse or subsequent pulses, collect those crystals from lower in the plumbing system and carry them up and deposit them higher, such as in the final resting place in this example. So this would be a, a, essentially a form of self-contamination, if you like. And then finally, we have the upper crust. And this should be by far the most prevalent place for crustal contamination to take place. We have lower confining pressures overall, um, which enhances the opportunities for fracturing of the rocks and brittle behavior because we are in the brittle domain in the upper crust. 
we have the presence of sedimentary basins, uh, much more likely in the upper crust than, than lower down. So these are rocks where there is access to crustal water, either bound to minerals or in pore spaces. Um, relatively high porosity of rock. Um, so, and relatively easy for magmas ascending to um, split rocks open and, and uh, expand spaces to form intrusions. And then the potential existence of relatively reactive rocks, such as carbonates, to participate in sort of uh, hydrous metasomatic type processes or to be dissolved and provide space for magmas to exploit. So the upper crust is by far the most receptive area for crustal contamination. So what kind of evidence do we typically see? Well, we can see actual chunks of crustal rocks sitting in mafic magmas, so rafts of crustal material, um, xenoliths of floor, wall, or roof rocks, which we then find in cumulus textured mafic rocks in the layered intrusions. So this doesn't tell us how much contamination happened, but it certainly signifies that there was interaction in these zones. And we commonly see these in the base of layered intrusions, um, where we would expect where the magma first interacted with the surrounding rocks and fractured them as it came in. We may expect these sort of marginal interactive zones between the crust and the, um, the intrusions. And then we can see evidence that this has, in fact, been consumed through the use of geochemistry. Um, so even where we don't find physical evidence, we can see chemical evidence. And we can look at more subtle evidence still in the form of radiogenic and stable isotope compositions. And then finally, we may find high temperature minerals, which have, let's call it anomalously high alkali contents and water contents. So in mafic rocks, finding logopites or apatites, for example, which have relatively high sodium and potassium contents, they are hydrous minerals. Um, it's not consistent with normal crystallization from the mineral assemblage which is going with them. There are other possible interpretations of these phases other than crustal contamination that remains a possibility. So just to illustrate this, here's some work from now 15 years ago by Sandler et al. on the Bushveld. There's some nice SEM photos of chromites at the top, hosting what are interpreted as inclusions of melt. And these tend to be relatively alkaline. You see some albite up there inside a chromite in the top right. And the geochemistry of these inclusions shows that they're relatively evolved compositions. The same sort of thing was described by Tuomo Alapieti and colleagues from Finland from platiniferous reef deposits in the Penicat intrusion in northwestern Finland. We see little albitic and phlogopitic inclusions in chromite here. Um, we see chemical evidence for crustal involvement. The one on the bottom left is kind of the cheat. So I'm using this as evidence for upper crustal contributions. In this case, it's an impact melt from Sudbury. So the whole melt is, excuse me, is homogenized crust. So what we believe happened after the impact melt formed is that it subsequently interacted with its floor. Um, and in the case of Sudbury, there's a clear geographic distinction between the floor in the north, which is um, late Archean gneisses, and the geochemical composition of that. those rocks plots above this diagram, so it's not an accident that that circle is up there. And in the southern side of the impact, the floor rocks are or include a large component of mafic basaltic rock, which I've circled there as Huronian. And that's where they plot. And we can distinguish the bits of melt sheet that have been injected into the floor rocks. We can identify contra chemical contributions from those floors. On the right, 
is a plot from Nick Arndt on the Bushveld, which indicates a correlation between the sill compositions that are interpreted as feeders to different parts of the Bushveld and average crustal compositions. For example, the lower part of the Bushveld, so the lower zone and critical zone, which are identified with B1 sills as con contributing magmas, have a geochemical signature very similar to that of lower crust, whereas the upper critical zone and main zone, which are fed by B2 and B3 magmas, potentially have a chemical signature very similar to upper crust. So the implication here is that at different times in the emplacement of the bushveld, different parts of the crust were being were interacting with the magnets as they ascended or somewhere along the way. Um, one of the features which has been identified with the Bushveld complex in particular has been the presence of isotopic anomalies in radioactive isotopes, and particularly strontium, over the years. So work done through Rhodes University in the 90s and Moose, Moose Kruger's work. And then Judith Kinnaird has followed up on that with lots of data in the late 90s and 2000s. So these plots all come from Judith's work, I think. And what we see is that the chromatites are associated with um, anomalously radiogenic strontium. And the easiest way to interpret that is contributions from continental crust. Um, here's an example which can be interpreted as evidence for deeper or mid-crustal contamination. This is from the Grenville province in Canada. So that's the geological equivalent of the Namakwa Natal belt here. So it's a one billion year old metamorphic age, high grade, nice terrain. And what we have here, I'm going to show you the colorized version of this map. What we have is a, a granite intruding the surrounding gneisses. So that and then the granite has been intruded itself by two anorthosites. So these are plagioclase cumulates. Um, a crustal suture was subsequently identified passing through the granite in between the two anorthosites. So this is representing a paleo terrain boundary, which distinguishes rocks on the north side, which all experienced their origins from the mantle, like the initial melting event that produced them, happened in the late Archean at around 2.7 billion years old, whereas south of the suture, the rocks formed in the middle of the Paleoproterozoic at around 1.9. Then they've been subsequently remelted to make granite, but that doesn't affect the Neodymium model ages, which is what those are based on. So what we have are two anorthosites on either side of the of terrain boundary. In, believed to be in the deep crust, separating rocks that are about a billion years old, different in age. And if we look at the epsilon neodymium plotted against neodymium concentration here on the bottom left, what we see is we can see those two patterns represented in the isotopic data in the anorthosites. So the anorthosite that's hosted by the older rocks lies on a mixing line with older rocks. And the data from Mercer Township lie on the younger mixing line. Because we're looking at cumulates to medium concentration, we're not looking at the liquid, which is what we like to pretend we're looking at when we're looking at mixing curves. So the exact position in medium concentration space is not critical from the point of view of falling on those curves. Here's an example from the Kemi intrusion, which is in Finland, in northwestern Finland. This is the largest igneous chromite deposit outside the Bushveld. And what this plot shows is epsilon neodymium again versus neodymium concentration once again. And what's been modeled here is mixing of a depleted mantle source, which is the blue star in the upper left, with crusts of different ages shown in the stars next to their ages. So the host rocks to the intrusion are around 2.5 to 2.8 billion years. The intrusion itself is 
all the rocks which have been identified in the area are around 3.1. So that's one of the oldest rocks we know of exposed. And what our modeling shows, so the green curve, for example, there are two green curves. There's one that you can see obviously spreading out across the, the diagram. That's the path of the, the liquid composition with minerals crystallizing from it. So the cumulate minerals that are crystallizing are plotting on a line which is basically just going straight down the left-hand axis of this. And the liquids that go with them are plotting off to the right here. And so what this shows us is that if you explain all the little dots on the left here, we actually need a crust that's at least about three and a half billion years old. So the crusts that are exposed at the surface, and even those exposed anywhere in the area, are insufficiently old to explain the isotopic data. So the implication is it must be deeper, older crust that's involved that we hypothesize its existence for the time being. So the implication there is that older crust is participating. So we use the term crustal contamination fairly loosely in general, and it's normally used to imply that we're talking about granitic crustal contamination which means high silica rocks with relatively high concentrations of um, alkali elements, high field strength elements, and large iron lithophile elements. The first couple of columns in the periodic table are things that tend not to be compatible in mafic rocks. Um, this can also include sedimentary rocks, quartzites and sandstones, for example, as well as carbonates and shale. So these are all our silicate materials. Sorry, not carbonate, but they can be some there. The most common cement in a, in a sandstone is a carbonate cement. And then we have our non silicate crustal rocks, which we tend to neglect unless we're working in the flat reef where some of it is jumping out at us. So you have carbonates, which very commonly form the floor rock through major layered intrusions worldwide. And these are non silicates and they're not enriched in the same alkali and high field strength elements, and evaporites, which are volumetrically minor, but potentially geologically very important. And they can be enriched in sulfur as well as in calcium, um, but not in silica. And we'll see why that matters as we move along. So what are the, the first effect we think of with crustal contamination is that we change the composition of the magma. Fair enough. So, we're not going to go into this. Suffice to say that the general characteristics of continental crust are well established and how they differ from typical mantled partial melts, which pr produce more light basaltic to andesitic type magma compositions. So we know what geochemical indicators we might want to look for. We're going to move on to slightly more subtle things. Um, here is a ternary phase diagram. It was developed in, the, I think it's 1911, it was published, something like that. So there's no excuse not to be familiar with it. This is the Forsterite anorthite silica diagram in which there is a paratectic reaction between Forsterite olivine and silica, which results in enstatite orthopyroxene being on the, the lower axis here. So typical mantle derived magmas might begin with a composition as indicated by the star. And if we look at Winter's textbook, the way we teach all of our undergrads, we almost always start with composition here, and we show them um, with crystallization of olivine and orthopyroxene what happens to the magma composition as temperature drops. However, if at some point during that process we contaminate our magma with granitoid continental crust, that material is represented in this space by silica in the bottom right corner, which means any contamination will pull the magma composition in this direction. And this will result in the crystallization of orthopyroxene rather than olivine. So the liquid line of descent, which is igneous for the liquid composition as temperature drops, so we can only move from an olivine bearing magma to an orthopyroxene bearing magma and never the other way around. 
There is no version in this space where normal equilibrium or fractional crystallization can cause a magma which is crystallizing orthopteric steam first to start crystallizing olivine later. It's not a possibility. We won't go into why. However, we could envision a case where a more evolved magma, so either one that has just been crystallizing normally or it has been contaminated by siliceous material, gets contaminated by a dolomite, for example. And in this space, dolomite is going to show up as mainly magnesium components. There's a little bit of calcium which would come out in the anorthite component. That's not going to change the story. So we could move things to the left in this space if we invoked carbonate contamination. And I've never seen this diagram invoked in any kind of discussion along those lines, but there's no reason it couldn't be. And I could think of places where it should be, specifically a whole bunch of really olivine and magnetite rich intrusions in southern China from the Permian. So here's a nice xenolith of dolomite in a mafic magma, just to show you I'm not just whistling Dixie here. So this is from the eastern bushveld. As I was looking at this slide, making this talk, I sort of had the feeling that they were watching this xenolith actually sinking through the magma as they were watching. They look so rapt. But it was two billion years ago and they're not. So the other effect of fossil contamination that's been widely invoked and is relevant to mineral deposits and specifically chromite deposits in the bushveld is Neil Irvine's original proposal for the production of um, chromatite layers based on crustal contamination. So just to quickly review, so this was his publication in 1975. So the implication is as the magma first crystallizes, it may start somewhere between A and B. It'll crystallize olivine and then olivine with a very small amount of chromite. We are in the very bottom left corner of a phase diagram with olivine, so forsteritic olivine specifically, chromite on the bottom right, and silica at the top. So we are crystallizing something like one and a half percent chromite in a cotectic assemblage, mainly consisting of olivine. So at some point, crustal contamination takes place and has a chance to affect the chemical composi composition of the magma. And that produces a new mixed magma at point D. And point D is now in the field of chromite only crystallization. So for the time it takes to crystallize from D to E, we are crystallizing only chromite in this space. And the idea is that this is a way to produce essentially a monomineralic chromatite layer. We may then end up with some interstitial silicate, as we tend to see, a little pyroxene in between the cracks. And this could occur as the magma then um, follows the path from D e to G and carries on. Um, Irvine does discuss the fact that depending on how much fossil contamination happens and exactly at what point during the crystallization it happens, the composition of the mixed magma, so point D, are sort of hybridized contaminated magma. So it could be anywhere in this space. So the exact lithological sequence we get may vary. And he shows how the still water and the Great Dyke and the Bushveld each of which have slightly different characteristics could be explained by this sort of model. Okay, so this kind of model has then been invoked in the Bushveld, most commonly uh, the work by Moose Kruger and Judith Kinnaird, so in the late 90s and early 2000s. And they developed a model illustrated most um, picturesquely in this paper by Kinnaird et al. 2002 on the top right. And this is really taking from Ian Campbell's, they did an experimental um, analog studies um, showing 
uh, interaction of liquids of two different densities. I think it was salinity specifically. And the models where the incoming magma plumes upward, forms a hybrid through turbulent interaction with the re resident residual melt, and then settles to the transient floor of the magma chamber. Kind of combining that with a version where the plume actually reaches the roof of the magma chamber. And then the process continues as illustrated in B there. So some version of this was invoked to explain this combination of chromatite layers associated with isotopic enrichments or increasingly radiogenic isotopic data at or just around the chromatite, sometimes just below it. Um, and they chose this as an alternative to the magma mixing model, which was Irvine's preferred model, which he published in 1977, having rejected his coastal contamination model. But he wasn't very clear about exactly why he was rejecting it in his paper. And the problem is magma mixing doesn't explain isotope um, enrichments. It doesn't explain why we'd have alkaline um, and hydrous minerals floating around in our chromatites. So this sort of circumstantial evidence supporting coastal contamination doesn't fit magma mixing. So if we want a single model to explain all of those symptoms, cost contamination seems to work best. So my interpretation of Irvine's papers, though, <clears throat> suggests that his main problem with coastal contamination to make chromatites is that if you use a granitoid, so it's not just silica, as is plotted on that phase diagram we just saw, because a granite has more in it than just quartz. It has potassium and sodium in it, making up the feldspars in the mica. And the presence of alkalis, and we can see in his experimental um, data plot shown here, he's mixing his forsterite with a K2O silica mixture. I'm going to show you a tidied up version of this in a second. Um, what happens is that when you add alkalis, it stabilizes the olivine and the orthopyroxene. So instead of moving you straight into the field of chromite, you actually, I haven't found a good way to illustrate this. It sort of needs a three dimension. Um, but what happens is that boundary essentially moves with you. So it turns out, so this is a mixing line, the red line shown in this diagram. So we're going from an initial composition up here and our mixing line then, instead of going straight into the field of chromite, takes a long time before it actually crosses the chromite plus liquid phase boundary. And it turns out that that corresponds to more than 50% contamination. And at the time Irvine published these data, which is in 1973, and this is in an internal um, Carnegie Institute publication. There wasn't a lot of data on the chromite com content or the chrome content of real um, layered intrusions. And if we look at the data from the Great Dyke and the Bushveld, that I have added to his plot here in the blue field. And what we see is that the chrome content is even much, quite a bit lower than any of the mixing lines that Irvine used as examples in his um, illustration. So it means that realistically, we need at least 50 and probably more like 60% coastal contamination in order to use a granitoid to produce a chromatite. So effectively, that kind of throws that model out. Um, we need magma mixing for energetic reasons. And by the time you're finished more than 50% contaminating a magma, it is no longer a basaltic magma anymore. So we should see dramatic compositional changes in those magmas, which is not what we see in the critical zone of the Bushveld. We're not seeing a granite hosting chromatite or a, a cyanite. So in theory, 
if we use a sandstone or a quartzite as a contaminant, that gets rid of the alkali problem. Um, so that could work to create a chromite or a chromite layer. However, the melting temperatures of pure quartzites, as well as aluminium-rich shales or pure carbonates, is very, very high. And we're talking about 17, 18, 1900 degrees. So we can't have it both ways in a way. We can't say, well, we could have a pure sandstone, then that gets rid of the alkali stability problem, because then we're stuck with a material with a really high melting temperature. So it's perhaps possible that the sandstone with some carbonate in it to lower the melting temperature, because as soon as we have a mixture of two things with high melting temperatures, we end up with eutectic mixtures with lower melting temperatures. So this isn't completely out of the question. I hope to have somebody researching this from next year. Um, but it means that the model we like historically is really not very helpful. Um, it is still fine for producing sulfur saturation. So here's a simple plot of iron, silica, and sulfur. Normal basaltic type magmas plot over here in the field of sulfur under saturation. Um, and contamination by almost anything. So if we contaminate it with siliceous material, with granitoid, crustal rocks, we will move into the field of sulfur saturation. If we contaminate them with sulfur-rich vapor phases or evaporites more usefully, we will also pull them into the field of sulfur saturation. And things like politic shales, I mean, um, pyritic shales, sorry, would lie somewhere in between. And these kinds of rocks have been invoked in places like Norilsk as the contaminant to provide sulfur and induce sulfur saturation in those deposits. So there's no problem with crustal contamination driving the formation of movable solids and them deposits. That's helpful. So in addition to changing the magma composition, what else does crustal contamination do? Um, so as the magma loses heat to the country rocks, it is cooling and that will result in crystallization of the magma. So it was obviously going to be crystallizing eventually anyway, but as it starts assimilating types of rock, that speeds up the crystallization process. And we refer to this linked assimilation fractional crystallization as an AFC process. So it just reflects the fact that we recognize that as we assimilate material and use up energy, it actually drives new crystallization. Um, if we are crystallizing anhydrous, so water-free minerals, which is normally the case in matrix climatic systems, that means the residual liquid gets progressively richer and richer in dissolved water, because none of it is going into the crystals. So we're going to look at the implications of both of those here. Um, incidentally, while it's doing that, it's also causing the magma to become more oxidizing. This is because the early minerals, olivine and the pyroxenes specifically, as well as badge, um, they only take divalent ions into their structures normally. They are not taking in Fe3+, for example. Um, so that means the Fe3 plus that is around is staying behind in the melt. The water content of the melt is also going up, which enhances the oxidation state. And if we are assimilating rocks, which are typically on average more oxidized, then that's also going to contribute to that. So uh, my favorite analysis of the thermal budget reaction is this work done by H.P. Taylor Jr., who's a big shot in oxygen isotopes and silicates and granites in the 80s and 70s. Um, in his, so he does a rough analysis of the energy required to heat up um, the country rock to partial melting and then complete melting temperatures. And essentially, you can kind of you can accommodate all of the heat loss from the system without having to kind of 
very specifically model each aspect of it in this bottom paragraph. So if we have two, if we have a magma assimilating material, which is the same temperature as the magma, so that's the magma mixing, then for every gram of cumulate, um, or every gram we assimilate, we will crystallize one gram of cumulate. And we can go all the way from that to about nine or 10 to one. So for every gram we assimilate of cold country rock, we will crystallize 10 grams of cumulus minerals. So that's, we're going to have a look at what that actually means then. Um, so first it means we our mixing diagrams are actually much more complex than we usually bother showing. So well, I'm not going to go into this in detail for you. This is a, an illustration from Taylor's paper using oxygen and strontium to illustrate this. So the dashed line going straight across the diagram would be the mixture of two end members where the concentrations of the two elements in question are the same in both cases. So, and there's no energy considerations. So we're mixing two things that have the same abundances um, and um, energy considerations. So it's just straight line mixing. This basically doesn't apply in real life. So if we're then mixing things where there is no temperature expression, so there's no temperature difference, but the concentrations of the elements are different, that then affects their isotopic composition. Um, the budget of the isotopic compositions, and that proves that produces the simple mixing curve, top one. So this kind of um, curve line is what we usually see in papers showing contamination and mixing, including the ones I've shown you earlier in this talk. If we want to take into account the fact that we are forcing the crystallization of cumulus minerals, which almost always have really low concentrations of the elements we're interested in, because cumulus minerals in mafic systems, um, they like their iron and magnesium, but they don't like almost any trace elements. So what that results in is a three end member mixing system, and that produces the sinuous curve instead. So as we said in the previous slide, a ratio of something like nine to one, so nine grams of cumulus produced for each gram of assimilant is probably realistic. So instead of this gentle um, curve shown at the top here for simple mixing, which is what we usually plot, it should actually be, actually be something more like this curve down here that's representing the real path of the liquid when we're mixing and contaminating because some of that material is being slurped out into the cumulus minerals. So um, what else does this do? As we crystallize the rock, um, we are raising the water content of the melt, and we can easily model that as the melt solidifies, shown as F on the x-axis here. The water content of the melt then is driven up proportional to the re residual volume of liquid. So that's a relatively straightforward model. And in this illustration, I've used conservative um, ratios of cumulate produced to assimilant. So instead of nine to one, I've, I've done the highest one here is five to one. So arguably this should be going almost twice as fast as that. So that means by the time we crystallize a magma, say 25 or 30%, we can have doubled or tripled its water content. So the next question is, so what? Um, one of the effects of higher water content is that the spinel minerals are stabilized relative to the silicate minerals or most of the silicates. This is the only known experimental study to date. This is work done by Ford et al in 1972 on samples collected from the moon. And what we see here is that as the water content of the rock increases, the spinel phase, specifically chromite, is much less affected by the higher water content than the silicate, including olivine, pyrotines, and feldspars. What we tend to see is that um, 
chromite and magnetite show relatively little effect of um, melting point depression, so their first appearance as crystals. Olivine is not very strongly affected, and nor is clinopyroxene, but plagioclase and orthopyroxene are strongly destabilized at higher water content. So we can also show that in our favorite phase diagram. So in the traditional anhydrous version of this plot, um, we can stick the spinel field into here too. So here's a rough version of the spinel. So the effect of adding, increasing the water content on this diagram, and this is done qualitatively, so I'm not saying how much water I've added to make this, I'm just bullshitting it. So the size of the spinel stability field, which is the circle in the top left, is normally left off these for simplicity. That should increase as spinels get more stable. The field of olivine should increase, and the fields of plagioclase and OPX decrease at higher water contents. So we should see an effect on the mineral stability, something like this. So how can we use this information? Well, we could have a rock which is currently crystallizing only orthopyroxene. So we're making an orthopyroxenite, which will soon become a norite when it's joined by plagioclase as it crystallizes, which would follow the green arrow from the red star until it hits the, red, the next red line. So this would be a norite being born. If we then hydrate this magma, the boundaries shift. What happened to my slide? The boundaries shift, and we now end up with oh, it's going the wrong way. That's what happened. Sorry. We'll fix that in post production. No, we somehow I've lost an image. So the position of the blue boundary here, though, what we see is that the um, the red star would now be lying to the left in the bottom left corner. So it would be lying in the field of forced right only. We would have changed from a norite crystallizing OPX only to an olivine bearing rock and then crystallizing OPX later. So by adding water, it would be the equivalent of making our rock more primitive than it was. And the places we might relate this to would be places like the UG2 and the Marensky Reef, where there has been no olivine in the crystallizing assemblage for hundreds of meters, basically through the entire um, critical zone. You've more or less left olivine behind in the lower zone of the bush belt. By the time we're in the upper critical zone, we haven't seen olivine for a long time, and then suddenly it reappears in these chromatite-bearing reef zones. And adding water is one way you might account for this. Okay. So, and this I haven't mentioned, I just added this slide about 15 minutes before the talk. Um, the obvious, the more obvious effects of adding water to a magma include facilitating coarser grain mineral growth, such as pegmatoids or heterogeneous grain sizes what we refer to as very textured rocks or taxitic rocks, if you're Russian. And, and people like Alan Boudreau have proposed that if we get the water up high enough, so about 5% water in a basaltic system, we will produce an insoluble um, hydrous phase, which can now dissolve sulfur and mobilize the calcophile elements in a system, such as the platinum group metal. And the other effect of higher water contents is that it lowers the melting temperature of magma, um, even whether or not we're seeing any textural or mineralogical effects of higher water contents. So the last little component of this talk um, is we tend to model coastal contamination by looking at the average composition of a potential contaminant. So we, we find a paper so we, we either look up average composition of upper crust, say, like good old McClellan and Taylor type papers. And if we're feeling 
extremely diligent. We look up, say we're looking at the bush belt, we look up the compositions of the trace elements in the Transvaal supergroup rocks and use that as a guide. And um, we then just use that bulk composition as our contaminant, and then we model it cleverly like I've been showing you. Um, however, in real life, we are almost certainly not experiencing 100% bulk wholesale melting of country rocks. If we were, we probably wouldn't see all these fragments of country rocks sitting in the floor rocks of layered intrusion. So what difference does this make? So it turns out that if you're looking at elements with partition coefficients of one or more, so that means these are compatible elements that like the minerals, there is no effect. So for any of those elements, partial melting is the same as bulk melting because most of the element is always left behind in the residual solid from the source. So we're talking about our, our xenolith fragment floating in a magma. So the elements that would like to stay in that granitic xenolith will tend to stay there. Um, there's always more of that element in the xenolith than is going to go into the melt. Um, so there's no effect. However, if we're looking at incompatible elements in the granite, there is an effect. And the more incompatible the element is, the larger the effect is. So here, I spent yesterday doing this model, coming up with the equation to make it work. So here we're modeling an element, we're doing three elements. So the yellow line at the bottom is an element with a partition coefficient of one. So as we progressively melt our xenolith, going from 5% to 100%. There is no change in the concentration of the melt, that element in the melt. So whether it's 5% melted or 100% melted, that element has not changed. An element with a partition coefficient of 0.5 is shown in the blue line. So what this means is when it's 50% melted, assuming this is equilibrium melting. By that time, all of that element available in the xenolith has now escaped into the magma around it. As we continue to melt the xenolith, we are now just diluting the concentration of that element in the, ma in the magma. So we're not able to add any more of it because it's all gone already. Um, so the concentration in the melt starts getting lower at higher concentrations or higher degrees of partial melt. And an element which has a partition coefficient of 0.1, which means it's 10 times more likely to want to go into the melt than stay in solids. And we'll see there are many elements to which this applies in specific minerals. Then we actually use up all of the element after only 10% melting. So if we have our xenolith of granite, by the time it's 10% melted, all of that incompatible element has escaped into the molten rock surrounding it. And as we continue to melt the xenolith, the concentration of that element decreases. So let's just go, what does that mean? So there are lots of incompatible trace elements that we might care about, especially for isotope modeling. So here are some examples of rubidium concentrations in some different reservoirs, such as more, which we're not really interested in, but for reference. Average continental crust is AC and average upper crust is UC. And we could calculate from that a effective partition coefficient for those elements. So if we assume that the upper crust is made up of basically a bunch of granites formed by melting of average crust, then this would give us a kind of really gross bulk partition coefficient for these incompatible elements. And what we see is that the range of those goes from about 0.3 to 0.9. So in the range I was just illustrating in the previous plot. So you may argue that that's not really realistic as um, an estimate of the partition coefficient. So we can become 
plus a year here, I can take partition coefficients from actual granitic rocks. Um, Roger Nielsen, who's been a pioneer in trace element partition modeling since the 1980s, um, has an online database called GERM. Um, and you can find partition coefficients for lots of different elements and lots of different minerals in lots of different rock types. And we can model from that. We can take the partition coefficients from that for granitic rocks. We can create a granite either using average normative granites, or I can take um, the mineral proportions from a eutectic melt as shown on the left. But the difference is the average granite seems to have a lot more plagic wave in it than a eutectic melt, which has roughly equal amounts of plage and orthoclase. And the effect is that we're still in the kind of same general range. It doesn't make anything more incompatible than it was from my really gross calculation on the previous slide. So everything's kind of in the same ballpark. So let's go back to what this means. So this means if we're talking about sort of 50% or less partial melting of a granitoid xenolith in a mafic magma, it means that elements such as strontium and edimum could be, depending on the partition coefficients, anywhere from say 10 to up to 40 or 50% higher in the melt that's produced than in the bulk contaminant. So especially if it's like 10% partial melted, um, this means, and I've shown this in the little table on the right, so if we've got um, an element which is um, say 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, which is what strontium was for the bulk partition coefficient, the concentration of neodymium of strontium in the melt would be 160, 170 parts per million instead of 100 parts per million, which is what it is in the parent rock. This is a significant difference. And what this means is that when we model the contamination and mixing, and we get numbers like 30% contamination from the isotope, but yet we're still looking at a mafic rock. It may be that this partial melting would allow us to get away with much smaller amounts of contamination. And then we start taking into account the fact that we're normally looking at cumulus and not liquids in layered intrusions. This means this gives us even more leeway. But ultimately, yeah, if we have a 30% contaminated basaltic rock, it should not be a basalt anymore, whatever the isotopes are telling you. 30% contamination by a granite produces a rock which is now a cyanide. And if we're not seeing that, then that's not what happened. And this might be one way to explain that apparent discrepancy. So this is my clever modeling from yesterday. So my wrap up here is that the effects of crustal contamination are that yeah, we would mainly expect it to occur in the upper crust, but that doesn't mean it can't happen elsewhere. And the main effects are changes to the melt composition. And we should remember that that's not always making it more granitic. Um, the effects of adding carbonate and adding water to the melt might have significantly different and much more profound kinds of effects. Um, it drives crystallization of the melt and it causes hydration and oxidation of the melt, ultimately favoring specific silicate minerals over others, in particular oxide minerals, such as the spinels, magnetite and chromite. And with that, I will thank you very much and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, that was a very nice overview. Uh, are there questions and comments on this? I'll open the floor to that. Um, Steve, one from me. I mean, I, what I'm what I'm taking away from this is is the in any any given layered mafic intrusion, you can have a number of processes going on, a number of contamination processes going on, and. Yeah. When you make comparisons between, say, the Bushveld, the Skergard, and uh, Stillwater, for example, can you 
track differences in these processes in each of these intrusions? Um, in theory. So yeah. in, in practice, this does become complicated by the fact that you are looking at cumulus normally. If you're looking at volcanic rock, this becomes much more straightforward and you can use Parker type diagrams where you're plotting silicon or magnesium or even zirconium against other elements. And these trends and the timing of those trends shows up much better. So in volcanic piles like the Karoo or Norilsk, it's, it's much more compelling. In rocks which are mixtures of crystals and liquids, it gets much more complicated. Um, the, and it ends up be kind of becoming kind of circular. So you could argue that, well, the places where we have chromatites and sulfides and PGE enrichments is telling us that these are places where certain types of contamination or hydration occurred, that those models were, ba were created based on observation and analysis of those layers. So it's kind of self-fulfilling. Um, but yeah, if you can unravel the effects of accumulation and compaction and trap liquid movement and re-equilibration. I mean, the, the last part of this talk is about um, subsolidus effects, and there can be some quite profound ones which even affect the, the modal mineralogical distribution of rock. So unraveling those things is, um, in theory, possible in practice and um, quite subtle and complicated. Okay. Are there any more questions or comments? Yeah, uh, uh, Steve, it's uh, Mike DeWitt here. Um, oh. I wonder if you, you mentioned in your second last slide uh, that you contamination of a basaltic magma uh, can result in, a, in things like a cyanide and so on. At what sort of depth does that occur? Well, I think my point here is that this doesn't occur really. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm sort of saying that when, when, we, when you read isotope papers um, where we spit out numbers like that, we start saying 30, 40% contamination. I'm saying that if that's true, you should see a cyanide. And that's not like the rock you analyze to get that number should be a cyanide. It cannot be a basalt if you've added 30% of a granite to it. You've taken okay. a rock with 50% to look and added something that's 75 or 70 something. You've got to be up around 60 now. That's not what those rocks look like. So effectively it's telling us that it was not bulk contamination by a granite site. So it's either that that is a, an, a manifestation of this partial melting effect that I've explored here or it's some other kind of contamination, some other process or some other end member that's been involved in that. Or the isotopes are not actually showing you cluster contamination. There's some other way of bringing in that isotopic signature that hasn't been considered. So we tend to treat the isotope systems, we sort of mentally decouple them from the, the other elements, particularly the major elements. So um, that's the point I was making. Okay, thank you. Where we can, where we find cyanides associated basaltic rock, we think that's um, deeper, probably, possibly immiscibility, um, and that's happening um, in the lower crust, probably, where um, mantle-derived magmas are interacting with the crust. Or there's a my colleague working on Tanzi Hua the Panxi rocks in southern China suggest that that's a silicate liquid immiscibility process. So as the basaltic rocks produced by plume melting of the upper mantle, as they start crystallizing at depth, they produce a cyanidic and a basaltic, an iron-rich basaltic separate magma that then ascend separately through the crust and end up kind of co-intruding, but they're not magmatically but they're not physically linked anymore in the upper crust. So that association of cyanides and let's say ferrogabros is well, well represented. Are there any more questions or comments?
Uh, Craig, can I just add two quick things? Um, yeah. Just a, as a reminder before you close, tomorrow we've got our CPD workshop. Um, so if you haven't signed up, please sign up for that. That's at 10. Um, I think you probably still can register. And then we've got another lunchtime talk at one o'clock. That's uh, from Victor Nzako, who will be talking on the influence of groundwater abstraction on surface water levels. That's tomorrow at one. Something to look out for. And then just back to Steve. Steve, I stole, um, I screen grabbed that um, heart shaped reaction rim. Um, <laughs> I will acknowledge accordingly. Um, I will use that similar to the ones I used from your part one presentations. Just to emphasize this one, I'll, I'll specifically emphasize the love of geology. Your previous one with the, yeah. with the <laughs> Pledge of Clay Spinochrist, I was emphasizing science over technology and the Correct. Corona one. So I did it again. And we're looking forward to part three um, of this presentation. Back to you, Craig. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, any last chance for comments or queries? Going once, going twice. You can email me. Steve, it looks like you've sold, you've sold the, the story to everyone. So thank you very much for this. This is a presentation that I'll be going over again. We have one person who's raised, raised his hand. Um, go ahead sure. and unmute yourself. No? Okay, well with that, Steve, thank you very much for this presentation. We do look forward to the third in the series. All right. uh, we'll uh, we'll keep everybody posted and, and get it scheduled. So with that, I'll close right. the meeting. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Ciao. Ciao.